This is Betting Weekly Extra Time, European edition. You're with myself, Dan Roebuck, senior handicapper Steve Wiss is alongside me, as are Daniele Fisichella and James Easton. The last international break of the season done and dusted. Steve, eight games to go in the Bundesliga and Liga, nine in the Italian top flight and in Spain. Are we into the business end of the season yet? Is it time to identify teams who perhaps have got a lot to play for? nothing to play for? Do we have to narrow the focus a little bit? How do you see it? Well, hello, Dan and James and uh, Daniele. It's uh, good to be back after the international break and uh, they need to abolish that March window, I think. it's. <laughs> um, I mean, even if there's like playoff matches that need to be played, then, you know, players are just going to have to miss matches for their clubs because uh, it was all a bit of a nonsense, wasn't it? You got too many players thinking about, you know, I don't want to get injured and things like that because we are now at the business end of the season. So, or did we uh, get did we get players that were faking injury? That was something I saw. <laughs> Man City funny. players going down after 10 minutes and suddenly sneaking off and not playing again. <laughs> it's, I, I Honestly, it, Arsene Wenger once said that all the international matches should be condensed into one window or something. Now, I, I think that's a bit extreme, but I, I really do think the March window certainly in Europe, needs to be looked at now because for a lot of different reasons. And, um, I mean, it's really good to have club football back and uh, ready to rock and roll. Business, business end of the season on the field, but also business end of the season for us. Yeah, let's hope we can kick on. We've been to, Are we five weeks in profit on the spin, Steve? Well, we've, we've right. turned it around. We are, the graphic might be not quite accurate, but um, we are now uh, better than minus 30 I mean, when you consider we were minus 43 units at one point, we've uh, we've been clawing it back and hopefully we keep doing it. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, Daniele, for those teams still in European football or domestic cup competitions, the betters have to work out from here on in just how interested some teams are. I mean, I, I looked at Fiorentina more than anything else. I mean, they're in the Coppa Italia semi-finals, in the conference quarterfinals as well. I don't think they're going to get Champions League by their league position. So when we look at Fiorentina from a, a Serie A point of view, do, do we leave them alone? Do we fade them? What What do you think? Is, is this the business end in Italy? It's tricky because with Italy being top of the ranking UEFA and perhaps having five teams next season and some of the teams that are pushing for the fifth spot qualification, Roma, Atalanta, Fiorentina, are also in Europe, is a bit tricky because by doing well in Europe, they also help themselves having a better chance of playing in the Champions League next season. But at the same time, they cannot discard the league form. So I think it's a very difficult complexion. Perhaps you could apply the logic to Milan, who are secured, surely they're going to play in Champions League next season, and now they've got the chance to win the Europa League if they manage to overcome Rome, of course, first to give a sense to a very good season. But I think it's going to be really, really tricky. And when it comes to Atalanta and Fiorentina, you know, the chances to get to a final are probably decent, perhaps more for Fiorentina than for Atalanta, of course, playing Liverpool. But yeah, don't discard the fact that, yeah, the fifth spot in Italy is such an El Dorado now that, you know, really... They need to give it all. It's in, it's a really interesting point, James, because I was speaking to someone about Aston Villa the other day, and they were saying, well, they have to get into the Champions League. Winning the Conference League doesn't get them into the Champions League, so they should forget about that particular competition, concentrate on the league. This is a team that you should be able to bet consistently from here on in if they're going to concentrate on the league. But as Daniele's point there, and I made the same point, it's like, well, hang on, if they win the Conference League, that means it helps sort of, you know, the Premier League's coefficient, it's it's a double-edged sword. You know, where do you go with this? If they do go deep into that competition and win it, potentially fifth spot in the Champions League could be, as I mean, I know there's two sort of fifth spots that's going to go to the Champions League. And there's all sorts of conundrums that betters have got to think about here. Yeah, absolutely. And the point about the UEFA coefficient, I think also applies very strongly to League One in France, Dan, because all season that's been a talking point. They've been concerned about losing their fifth spot in the European rankings to the Netherlands, that fear has sort of been put to one side now because the French teams have done very well. But there are teams in France who are going to find this conundrum. Uh, Marseille come to mind. They're still in Europe. They've got a chance of you know, maybe winning a trophy. But at the same time, they need to make up ground in the league because their priority has always been getting into the Champions League. So there's all sorts of uh, permutations and decisions that clubs have got to make. I think one general point on League One, Dan, which I don't know if this applies to the other major leagues in Europe, but games from here on in 
do tend to be a little bit higher scoring. I was looking at the stats, the final sort of eight or nine match days in League One in the last three seasons, 60% or so of games have gone over 2.5 goals. Now, the season generally in League One has been lower scoring so far. So maybe at the end of the season, the number of over 2.5 goals matches would drop as well. Then, of course, you've got to factor in prices. Are the prices going to shorten because the market is aware of this? But there are all sorts of trends at the end of the season because games are so important at the top and the bottom of the table that it does almost become like a mini season, really. Interesting. Love the overs and unders. We've been talking about it all season long. And I'm going to talk about it again now with Steve's first pick. We've got our usual mix here. We've got two unit plays. We've got some hot dogs for you. We've got a little overs section at the end as well, where all the boys have picked an overs um, to get stuck into this weekend. Uh, Steve, Borussia Mönchengladbach versus Freiburg. We're going to kick off with here. It's 10.30 a.m. Eastern time on Saturday. Uh, Gladbach plus 128, Freiburg plus 195, the draw plus 265. But we're focusing on the goals here. Now, August to December, the Bundesliga, if you played over two and a half, You've got around about 7% return on investment. Since the turn of the year, you're looking at unders for a similar percentage, but you're booking the trend with your play here, Steve. Yeah, I think James actually makes a very good point there, that we're now into a section of the season where we we should really expect goals to accelerate across every mainstream European league. It's just the way things work out. It's been a long season for a lot of sides. Often they want to sort of uh, release the shackles a bit. Uh, motivation can be questionable. Um, you know, the intensity is not quite as much there for teams to defend. And I like targeting these sort of fixtures, actually, at this stage of the season. Uh, a mid-table battle, effectively, between 12th and 9th place in the Bundesliga. And Borussia Munch and Gladbach and Freiburg. You know, I think it's fair to say, you know, nine clear Gladbach from the drop. I don't think they're going to be going down. And Freiburg are in kind of no man's land. They're seven behind sixth place at Frankfurt. So look, they might as well have a go here and, and try and close that gap down with no real pressure on their shoulders. So I immediately like the overs. Over 2.75 goals at minus 118 for the two unit play. Because I do think this goal line should be at three, really. Um, any match involving Borussia Munch and Gladbach, you know, this season they've been mostly profitable for me. I mean, I had have got stung in, in that under run, as we call it. I think we'll look back on the season and we'll, we'll be like, that was the under run for the Bundesliga in the winter. But I fully expect the overs to come back firing again. There's a really interesting head-to-head -head here. Um, the last four meetings, two of them have actually ended nil-nil and the other two have ended three-all. So, yeah, it's like all or nothing, isn't it? Uh, before that, Freiburg actually won this fixture 6-0. So, this could be... Uh, this could potentially get a bit crazy. It was three all earlier in the season. And, um, you know, there was a three all draw recently for Gladbach against Cohen as well. So I think we'll see something quite similar. Um, most of the time, this, the style that they play is, is has been really open. Occasionally, they've adapted against some of the bigger clubs like Leverkusen, Leipzig. They dug in a bit more. This is not a match at home to uh, Freiburg where they're just going to you know, play for a 1 0 suddenly down. Freiburg have actually been involved in a crazy number of matches with goals since the winter break. They've been one of the few over teams. So let's stick with that. Um, you know, nothing really to me here that suggests it's going to be a boring, low-scoring contest. So it's my most confident selection of the weekend coming up. Borussia Mönchengladbach against Freiburg. Over 2.75 goals. Genoa Frosinone next for Daniele. Uh, this one, 10 a.m. Saturday. Uh, Genoa are the minus money favourites here. Frosinone, three to one shots. Uh, 19 goals in 14 home matches for Genoa this season, Daniele. But I sense that this bet is more about Frosinone, who are pretty leaky on their travels. Worst defence in Serie A, six go 60 goals conceded. Newly promoted as Genoa, who only conceded 36. And I think the difference is all there. Frosinone haven't won a single game by 1-0 this season. And I think at the end, this is going to come back and bite them. Uh, look, if they keep the same average, the same number, they're going to end up conceding 79 goals this season. Far too many to hope to stay up. Only one win since the beginning of December for Frosinone. Two clean sheets all season. 
no wins away from home. The only side that haven't picked up three points on the road in Italy. Um, they beat Genoa, by the way, 2-1 in the reverse fixtures. 11 of the last 14 games for Frosinone have been both to score, whereas Genoa only failed to score twice at Marassi against uh, Milan was uh, one of them. They kept three clean sheets, okay, but, you know, they got players in great form. Retegi, two goals for with Italy, good Monson, four goals with the national side, with the Icelandic that didn't qualify in the end. Malinowski qualified to the Euros with uh, Ukraine. Only lost three games, as we said, Genoa, since mid-December, and they also scored in those three losses to Atalanta, Inter and Monza. I feel that, you know, when Frosinone are involved, is rarely, rarely a 1-0 or is an under 2.5 goals. Over 1.5 goals for Genoa, minus 103. So Genoa scores two or more. You do win the stake, which is two units. Team total we're going for there. Genoa, as Daniele has explained, just a shade minus money. So nearly evens your bet for your two-unit play for Daniele, who's been banging them in since the turn of the year. Uh, James's two-unit play uh, sees Lorient take on Brest. This is 7 a.m. Sunday, so early Eastern time. Uh, Brest are the minus money favourites. Lorient nearly three to one. According to the table, uh, Brest are the second best team in France right now, uh, James. Uh, but you are fading them here. Yes, I am fading them. The pick here, Dan, is on Lorient or Thai on the double chance market, which is available at minus 117. So if Lorient win or the game ends in a draw, then you're going to make a profit here. So it is one of those games, as you say, when you look at the league table, you think, well, why on earth would you would you be back in Lorient here? Maybe even the draw, why would you back that? But actually, although Brest are second and Lorient are down near the bottom in 15th, if you look at the form recently, Lorient's form is pretty good. So since the start of February, they've played seven matches. They've won four, they've drawn one, and they've lost only two. So actually in that seven game period, Lorient have managed more points per game than Brest. Brest have done okay. They've won three, they've drawn three, and they've lost only one. But I think looking at the past two months, this is actually a far more even contest than the market would suggest. And I think when I went through the prices and looked at the home teams, Lorient are a standout this weekend as far too big, in my opinion, uh, based on the form. So it's really a case of forgetting about the league table with this game. Don't worry too much about the fact Brest are second. It's really that form. And obviously motivation. Brest, yes, they'll be motivated because they're going for a Champions League place. But Lorient will definitely be motivated because they're near the bottom and they're battling against relegation. So far more even contest than the market would suggest. One piece of team news here, Dan, which I think is absolutely crucial for Brest. Pierre Lise Malou is suspended. So for people who haven't followed Brest that closely, Pierre Lise Malou is a centre midfielder. He's been one of the best players, not just for Brest this season, but in the whole of League One. I think he's got a pretty good chance of being on the League One player of the season shortlist. Massive, massive player for Brest this season. Gets on the ball a lot, very progressive, both carrying the ball and passing the ball. They will be a far weaker proposition this weekend away at Lorient without him. So that's my pick on the game. It's Lorient or tie on the double chance market and it's available at minus 117. Brest missing a key piece and the current form rather than the seasonal form pointing in Lorient's direction. We've got a hot dog to come in this game as well. Um, we've got a hot dogs coming up now. Uh, Steve Danielli and James obviously have got a big price runner uh, for you this weekend. We're still in pocket for the hot dogs this season. At 10.30 Saturday, we're going to start here with Steve's big price. This is Leverkusen versus Hoffenheim. And Steve's gone slightly mad with his selection here, Steve. I had a feeling you'd say this, Dan, because, <laughs> <laughs> because there's I know overs you... And there's overs. There's overs <laughs> and there's overs. Tell us the bet first. Just tell us the bet first. The bet is over four and a half goals. <laughs> oh. is, uh, is plus one ninety five. Is this... Is, is this a, is this the first time you've ever tipped up over four and a half any show in your tipping I, career in your handicapping I did one. career? Yeah, yeah, over four. I did, had a hot dog at over four and a half. This what season. for us this what. season? Yeah, he didn't win. It didn't win. Oh. No, it ended nil nil. It was that crazy. It was that Leverkusen Gladbach game. It ended nil nil. Do you remember it? That uh, everyone yeah. was, every man and his yeah. dog was on the over. Goal that, line. that was um, that was the one after Klopp had just 
um, yeah. said he was leaving, wasn't it? It was, yeah. it was the vet. He that was, was suddenly there's a lot of focus on uh, on Jabby Alonso. <laughs> anyway, over four and a half here. Uh, to what's the price? Plus plus one ninety five. Talk, talk us through this one. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you say mad here. The actual main goal line for the game is three point seven five. So we've got a really high goal line because the, you know the books are expecting um, both sides to to rack up the goals or certainly Leverkusen and um, yeah the hot dog's not been going so well for me recently. I was really torn with two or three plays this week. I've decided to go with this match because I mean Hoffenheim all season. I mean they, they just don't do clean sheets at all, um, like hardly any. Um, but the two or three maybe in all competitions this season. They can't defend um, at all, but we know they've got, usually got goals in them. I mean, the last time they played, they lost at Stuttgart against Stuttgart 3 0. It was one of the few times they didn't get on the score sheet, but they had enough chances. Uh, we all know about by Leverkusen's brilliant campaign. I mean, they could they could end up for a team that hasn't hardly ever won a trophy. They could end up with a treble. They could get a huge pot of gold this season. They the only Bundesliga one team left in the cup. They got chances in the Europa League, they're 10 points clear in, in the Bundesliga and they just got to tick off the matches now, tick off the points and you know, I'm trying to work out if this is a sort of match they'll enjoy or not because Hoffenheim will leave things a bit too wide open for them so they'll get chances but at the same time they're facing a team who will you know swing and have a good go. If we look at the average goals per game for Hoffenheim this season, 3.6 goals per game average overall, um, only the likes of Bayern and Gladbach have a higher average than that. And Leverkusen, we know that they pack a huge uh, firing power, 66 goals across the Bundesliga this season. So with the goal line as high as it is, 3.75, knocking on the door of an Asian goal line of four, which I think that's what it'll kick off as, especially. I mean, there's a chance Victor Boniface could come back here um, into the squad for Leverkusen. That's a, a massive weapon they're going to have at their disposal for the rest of the season, by the way. Uh, then, um, you know, I think... Four and a half goals is is suddenly not looking so unattainable, is it? And you know, I, I had a feeling you would um, look at the stats and, and be like, mm, it's not covered that often for the teams this year. About one in every three, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but it's still quite high for over four and a half goals. Yeah. Well, I can tell. You know? Look, look Le- Le- Leverkusen six out of twenty six, Hoffenheim seven out of twenty six. Uh, one of those teams is profitable if you backed over four and a half goals every game. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's and it's, like, and it's, it's, Hoffen- half- it's Hoffenheim, not Leverkusen, but yeah. It's because it's such a big price, you see. Whenever you yeah, don't have yeah. to hit such a high percentage for profit, Correct. sometimes, yeah, on, on Leverkusen so, just, just slightly under. That's all. Looks like a good play. I mean, I think Leverkusen will win the game, uh, but I mean, Hoffenheim again, a bit like Freiburg, they're in that position of nice bit of freedom, eighth place, not a lot really to play for. They might as well have a go and come here. They're not just going to sit and like take a one nil little beating there. So, uh, yeah, over four and a half goals is the hot dog here. At uh, plus one ninety five, I'm due to hit one of these again soon, and I think this match could explode. Uh, speaking of madness, um, what's what's the definition of madness? Um, doing the same thing over again and expecting oh, a different what? result. Yes. Um, well, uh, Daniele talked to me about Stefano Colatuono. If I've got that right, he's back at Salonitana for for the hundredth time. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Is this the and is this the sixth coach that they've had this season? So no, only the, many, four, only, four, only, four, only the only four, only the four, not only quite the record. Anyway, your, your hot dog surrounds Bologna Salernitana, Salernitana with a new old coach. Yes, Stefano Colantuono, fourth manager of this season, so obviously a manager for the future for Serie B when they're gonna play next season, and God knows when they're gonna come back to Serie A because I think <laughs> they stayed up quite miraculously in the last couple of uh, years. But this this year the wheels have come off. Look, you say why why you're so negative about Salernitana because you got 14 points in the table, and last season at this stage of the season, Sampdoria had 13, Cremonese had 16. Sandoria Cremonese are not playing in Serie A this year. So Salernitana are definitely going to be relegated. They're not going to pick up average 2.03 points per game in the last nine games. So see you later. See you in the next century, probably. Bologna, second in the home table, only three points behind Hinter. Uh, now they have the, the same points, 54, as they did the entire last season. So uh, Tiago Motta is doing an extraordinary job. Only one defeat in the last nine. 
lost to home, a home to Milan and Inter, only failed to score to Milan, Inter and Napoli. I think they can score a couple of goals against the bottom of the table. Salernitana, that's why I go for the over 3.5 goals plus 185. You need four goals or more to win this bet. But Salernitana, the bottom side in Serie A, they score in five of the last seven away games. If anything, they'll play you know, with freedom, with desperation, at least to nick a goal. But, you know, be mindful because obviously Bologna defense is really, really good to the fourth in Serie A. But as I said, he's an odd dog, he's a long shot. Over 3.5 goals plus 185. 6.30 Monday, incidentally, lots of Serie A fixtures on Monday um, this weekend, 6.30 a.m. 7 a.m. Sunday for James's uh, hot dog. Once again, we go to the shots on target market. Uh, Julien Ponceau is the player in question. Have we backed him before? Has he won us money before, James? We have backed him before, and he didn't actually. Ah. It wasn't that. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. He did actually get in a great position for a shot on target. I was watching the game, and he very unselfishly squared it to an opponent, which was quite frustrating. But it's one of those things psychologically where if you do back a player and he, he you know, it doesn't pay off, you can then think, well, I'll, I'll write him off. But actually, it's sometimes the wrong thing to do because when I went through the prices here, Julian Ponso is still, in my opinion, far too big to have over 0.5 shots on target. So that's why I was happy uh, to back him again here. He is available at plus 200, which means he's actually the biggest player, biggest priced player um, available for Lorient on the Bet Rivers site in this particular market going into this game. And I think his chances of having a shot on target are much better than that price suggests. So just for people who don't know Julian Ponso, He's a number 10, really, in the way that Lorient play at the moment. They tend to use a 3-4-2-1 formation with a couple of attacking midfielders uh, behind uh, Bamba, the centre forward. Uh, Julian Ponso is one of those players that plays just behind the main striker. Um, I think he's played pretty well in 2024, and so does the manager who's been picking him in every game. In his last eight matches, he's managed a shot on target in five of them. So five out of his last eight games have seen him have a shot on target. On the basis of that admittedly quite small sample, this price of plus 200 is obviously far too big. He should probably be near a plus 100 if you're looking at that sample. And I think, you know, if he does keep getting picked, I don't think the number of games where he's having a shot on target will actually drop too dramatically because he is a good player um, at getting into the penalty area and having shots on target. Just to go back to the... um, the two unit pick as well, Dan, which is on the same the same game. I think the fact that Pierre Lees Malou is missing for Brest, if anything, increases Ponceau's chances of getting a shot on target here because Pierre Lees Malou's job in the Brest team is to screen the back four for Brest. And without him there, I think there'll be a bit more space for Ponceau to get into the penalty area. So he didn't work out for his last time, but I am willing to back him again because I do think this price is too big. So the pick is Julian Ponso to have over 0.5 shots on target for Lorient at plus 200. And just on the price, Dan, because I know we've been asked before, what if the price changes? Honestly, I would go down to about plus 160, plus 165 uh, with this particular pick if the price does move, because I think all the way down to those sort of odds, I, I still think you'll get in good value here. Let's get some more regular picks uh, through from the boys to come. We've got one in Germany, one in Italy, one in France. We're going to start with Steve in Germany, Stuttgart against Heidenheim. This is 11.30 uh, Sunday, where Stuttgart are the short price favourites. Probably not getting the headlines in Germany that they maybe should, Steve, due to Leverkusen's uh, terrific season, but probably on course to return to the Champions League for the first time in over a decade. What's what's your thoughts? What's the pick in Stuttgart, Heidenheim? If this pick wins, I'm going to have a really massive smile on my face, Dan, because Heidenheim have annoyed me all season. There's a lot of frustration building up behind the scenes here with me with this team. And I want to, I really am desperate to see them get absolutely battered, to be honest. Um, so the bet is Stuttgart, team total, over two and a half goals at uh, plus 100, even money, this bet. I, I nearly went the hot dog over, over three and a half team total which would have been a bit of madness, actually, because um, you do want the 3-0 three, three nil to Stuttgart has been quite a popular scoreline this season. So um, I did want that one on my side. I think they win comfortably well, basically. The Asian handicap line here is minus 1.75, knocking on the door a minus 2. And that's because, I mean, look, every time I watch Stuttgart play, you cannot fail to be impressed with how well they are coached. I think that they're an unbelievable... You're right, more should be talked about the Stuttgart side. 
like all year, I mean, halfway through the season, we were like, well done, you know, they deserve to be where they are, but they're likely to drop off just because the squad, I mean, the squad is only really mid-table quality, Dan. Like, seriously, I mean, there's some good players in there like Garassi and etc. But really, they should have no right to be anywhere near third. But in terms of the metrics, in terms of the performances, they absolutely have not fluked anything. So something's really going right, isn't it, at this club? And it looks like they should really qualify from this position for the Champions League. And this is a, unless the pressure starts to get to them, then I just don't see them slowing down. They're like a train. They're a lot, lot better than Heidenheim. They actually lost against them earlier in the season. I remember watching the game and um, they murdered them really, but somehow lost. Didn't have Garassi that match, I don't believe. He was injured. Um, now they've got him back here at home. I expect them to dominate. It should be a lights to flag victory. And the best thing about Stuttgart is they keep going right till the end. They don't just hang up their boots and, and be like, OK, we're, okay, we're fine with a 2-0 win. They'll keep going looking for more goals. And goal difference might be important in this Bundesliga uh, race for the top four. So, um, I, I mean, Heidenheim, I've said all year, they just... They've overachieved massively. They're, they're in that mid-table spot now, 29 points. They're not going to be going down. That's I think that's enough points already, really. Um, I don't rate them. They have a knack of scuppering me too often. That's why I didn't take the handicap. It could be just like them, wouldn't it, to grab a goal or two. So I'd much rather take the team total off Stuttgart. All we need is three goals from Stuttgart, which might sound a lot, but there's something that they've managed to rack up on several occasions recently um you know since the turn of the year i think they've covered this in about 70 percent of their games loads of goal scoring potential in them and yeah i think this heidenheim beatdown is is due um I, I want them to slaughter them here yeah? really do i want to see a big number racked up by stuttgart and um you know i don't just want three goals i don't just want to win the bet i want to see them get them <laughs> so that's the bet. Over two and a okay. half team total goals for Stuttgart, plus 100. Come on, VFB. <laughs> An irrational hatred of, of Heidenheim by Steve Wiss, uh, uh, a novella. Um, I think Heidenheim has to go on our list of... Who have we got on that list at the minute? Cagliari? Have we got Bochum on the list? Or is Bochum? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember who we've got well, on can we, we look Bochum? You, we can't have Bochum on the list when you support them, Dan, can we? So. <laughs> Uh, let's get to Lazio Juventus with Danielli. Um, 1 p.m. Saturday, this one. Lazio plus 200. Juve plus 148. Their favourites. What's happened to Juve, Danielli? One win the last eight. I make it. What's the situation there? Poor squad, I think. Probably the reality. The reality check for uh, for Allegri, for their players. I think they overachieved. But yes, even to their standards, which have not been great this season, they let themselves down a little bit. Seven points in the last eight, which, by the way, is the same tally as Lazio. But Lazio sacked the manager. Juventus are stuck with Allegri. See for how long. Yeah, well, just on that, because we talked about it last year and probably the season before, because he had such a long contract, it was like, well, we can't get rid of him because it's going to cost us a fortune. Surely that length of contract at some stage becomes you know, palatable for those in charge to get rid of him. Do you think he'll go in the summer? Allegri, well, they're talking about his renewing his contract, but <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think this, the management of Juventus sees there's been progression, there's been enough opportunity for the young players, and, you know, it says that the, the team somehow has achieved the minimum objective, which is finishing the top four, but what if they go from now? Yeah, it's a big question mark. Um, this is obviously a dress rehearsal of the Coppa Italia semi-final, yes. which comes up first leg again at Stadio Olimpico in midweek. Um, I don't know if that plays into the minds of the coaches here. What's the bet, Daniele? Talk us through the play. The bet is both teams to score minus 106. There is new man in charge in the Lazio bench, which is Igor Tudor, who used to be a player for Juventus, played 105 games for them, former assistant of Pirlo at Juve, work at Udinese, work at Verona, work at Marseille. He's been a manager for the last 15 years, and now he's got a big problem in his hand, which is solving Lazio goal-scoring issues. Only... Immobile is in double figure for Lazio this season in all competitions, but only six goals in Serie A, four from the spot. Uh, Lazio are really, really bad for creating scoring opposition. 17th for shot in Serie A, 10th best attack, only eight for possession this season. Last year, they were fourth. So, but we have to look back perhaps at the record of Tudor in the last season in Italy. 
and in France. Well, with Verona in up to 2022 in May, they finished nine, which was the record finish for the club from the mid 80s. But they also had the fourth best joint attack. All the three strikers of Verona in the season, Barak, Caprari, and Simeone, ended in double figures and obviously got sold. And when it came to Marcel, and I think James uh, we might be able to add something more on that, last season, they only failed to score six times in 48 matches in all competitions. So they were a scoring side. And, you know, 34 years old, Alexis Sanchez scored 18 goals for Marcel, his best ever tally since leaving Arsenal. So there is hope for Anderson, for Isaacson, for Immobile, for Castellanos to score more goals. So what is Tudor going to bring? He's going to bring a more high press quick quick transition style of play, a more one-on-one marking all over the pitch, physically demanding, of course, but if the players of Lazio will follow his advice, I think they could get some benefit from playing a little bit more on the front foot, if you like. No Vlaovic for Juve. He's suspended again. In the last two months, Juventus have only scored nine times, three against Frosinone. But, you know, I think the four of us together could score a goal against Frosinone <laughs> at the moment. And they only kept one clean sheet. But, you know, Juve have only failed to score twice this season away from home, whereas Lazio at home only kept four clean sheets. I do like the both teams to score minus one. 106, possibly a draw. James, he got Tudor. What was he like at Marseille attacking? Yeah, pretty attacking. It's funny, you know, because nearly all the talk when he was at Marseille, and Steve will remember this, was about, you know, his man management style. He was quite blunt, we were told, with the players, which didn't go down well with everybody. I think Matteo Guendouzi, who's no longer there, really liked him and enjoyed it. Some other people, not so much. So it's, yeah, it's funny, really, because... Uh, we didn't talk too much about the the tactics, but they were you know they were pressing. They worked extremely hard. He wanted these players to be fit. He wanted he wanted them to run uh, hard. And Alexi Sanchez uh, did well. And it was a surprise actually when he when he left Marseille, wasn't it really? But because at the time he'd, he'd done pretty well. So it's odd. Marseille had such a turnover of managers. I think a lot of people have forgotten already that he was manager there because they seem to come and go so quickly. I I, remember him one thing I'll there, say yeah. about Tudor is that. Um, I wonder if he'll come in straight away and use his preferred formation, three four one, uh, three four two one. Should, should. should. And if that yeah. happens, then watch out for the whoever's going to play wing back for Lazio will start piling in the shots, maybe even a shot on target. So I don't know who that would be, Danielli, but that might be a market where yeah, Lazzari probably Lazzari and Marusic. Yeah, definitely bombing forward because mm. he's going to play with two anchors with Guendouzi, which has got him at Lazio. He's lucky to find him there again, and Cataldi. So yeah, you would expect the two wing backs. Yeah, absolutely, great point. Watch out to, for that. Uh, definitely to push forward. Yeah. Oh, good knowledge from you three. We can have you back next week. <laughs> uh, Marseille versus Paris Saint Germain uh, for. James to tackle for his second play. This is 2.45 uh, Sunday. Le Classique. Uh, still huge for the fans, I'd imagine. Uh, James, will this mean that Luis Enrique can't really tinker with his team? We know that Mbappe has been, you know, not finishing games, not starting some um, in Liga uh, this season. Obviously, there's there's still a bit of time till they re-engage in the Champions League, but the, the Coupe de France, of course, in midweek as well. Do we see rotation or is it one that you just can't do because it's Marseille away? Yeah, I think he will rotate here, Dan. And actually, a lot of my thinking on the pick is that that will happen. My pick being under three goals at minus 125. So if there were exactly three goals in the game, you would get your stakes back. You can only lose here if the game has four or more goals. Um, a lot of it is, as I say, to do with rotation and more specifically Kylian Mbappe, who I do not think will start this game and, and maybe won't play it at all. So just to clear up the situation with Mbappe, um, Luis Enrique, the PSG manager has told Mbappe, we are told, that he will no longer necessarily start in league games, but that he will start in Coupe de France games as long as PSG are in that competition and also Champions League matches. Now, given that Mbappe's just had two matches for France during the international break, and given that next Wednesday night PSG have that French Cup semi-final at home to Rennes, where Mbappe will start, I don't think they'll pick him here from the start because um, that's what Luis Enrique has said uh, is is likely to happen. He will be on the bench in some games. Now, the difference it makes when Mbappe isn't in the team to PSG's chances of scoring lots and lots of goals, it sounds obvious, but it is worth underlining because it is just a completely different side. And um, if he doesn't start here, I would expect the price 
on goals to change anyway. It might change even before the teams are announced if we get wind of the fact that Mbappe is not likely to start. So that's my thinking on the match. I think uh, the probability is that Mbappe will be on the bench and therefore it will be a lower scoring game. And the second factor on the match is really to do with Marseille and the fact that in their final two matches before the international break, they didn't play very well and they conceded five goals. They lost 3-1 uh, away to Villarreal in Europe and then they lost 2-0 away to Rennes. So I think Jean-Louis Gasset, the manager uh, at Marseille, may be pretty defensive here. I don't think he'll play just for a draw. They'll have one eye on winning the game, but I think they'll look at trying to improve the defence compared to what we saw in those last two matches before the international break. So it could be fairly cagey. And without Mbappe on the pitch, I think we've got, um, obviously, if, if that is the case, we've got a chance of a lower scoring match. So I think the chances of having four goals or more, it's not one for me where I expect to see four goals or more. And that led me towards this pick. So the selection is under three goals and it's available at minus 125. Steve, thoughts on the classic briefly? To be honest, I actually would go the other way. I think usually goals is a better idea to be backing in this game. I, I can't believe Mbappe not starting in La Classique would be crazy, I think. If they didn't start him, then that would really be quite a strong power position for the manager, to be fair. I just can't imagine that. I mean, he's a boyhood PSG fan and he loves scoring the goals against Marseille, unfortunately. Um, got a great record against them down the years. Um, I, he'll be chomping at the bit to play. I mean, look, he calls the shots everywhere, doesn't he? If he wants to play, he plays, surely. That's the way I would see it. Um, he'll put his foot down if he has to. Um, but maybe it's one of those games where you are better off waiting for the lineup. I'm not sure. But, I mean, their record at the Velodrome is sadly excellent. They've not lost here in a decade or more. They usually raise their game for this one, PSG. And, I mean, I think it's interesting how Gasset is going to play it. If it's the, the same Gasse that we've seen since he's joined Marseille, then it might be quite a good game. But will he go? Will he go into his shell and fear a drubbing? There's a lot of question marks about this this match. But usually the way it goes is that PSG win fairly comfortably. There's a few goals around, and Mbappe any time is is a banker. That's usually how this fixture goes. So I don't know unless. Is the script suddenly going to change? I'll believe it when I see it. Maybe I'm being a bit of a pessimistic Marseille fan there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> let's just see what that lineup brings. Mm. Be a massive flex, as they say. From oh, I'll tell you what they do like, or bet I do like in this game, um, is actually corners. I quite like corners in this game. Both teams rank really high for corners, and it's a sort of fixture where defenders get a bit more desperate and will be more no nonsense rather than trying to play it out from the back sometimes. So, um, it can get a bit frantic in the sort of the final third. So I like I think over nine and a half corners would, would wouldn't be a bad bet here. Um we have got two more sections to get through. So we're gonna rattle through these. Uh, just some big games across the weekend and into Monday uh, that we haven't got official plays on, but I know they're gonna be popular uh stateside. It's Real Madrid Athletic Club and Inter against Empoli on the Monday. Real Madrid Athletic Club um on Sunday, uh 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Real Madrid are favourites here. Uh, Steve, they're eight points clear at the top. After this, they haven't got another game until the Champions League uh, fixture against Man City. I mean, d does Ancelotti rest players? Does he tweak things? Does he wrap players in cotton wool? Have you got any sort of angle in here? Athletic Club, of course, you know, battling to, to maybe make the Champions League. Athletic Club are a really good side. They served me well on the last show. And I did look at this game. I was really tempted to to back them on the plus one Asian handicap. Actually, the um, every I swear down every single week there's a massive temptation to bet against Real Madrid for me. I don't know whether it's because I how's, how's that as, working out? <laughs> well, I'm never as high on them as some other people. I, I don't know why they never actually seem to play a convincing ninety minutes. That I know often. what you mean. You know, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. They they find ways to get results, though. You know, they're oh, yeah. a result team. I, I've and lost they... a fair share of money backing against them this season, don't we? Yeah, I mean, plus one Asian Bill Bow don't get beaten big very often, even in this matchup. Um, the look at the last twelve; they've only lost it by more than a one goal margin on three occasions, and and all those were two nil. I mean, that would be the danger scoreline here, something like two nil to Real Madrid. I quite like the under on on the back of the. International break, perhaps. Vinicius Junior is suspended, I do believe. Oh, is he? This ah. game. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I, I was looking. Um, so that would be quite a loss. 
I think Bilbao keep this close, and I'm not saying they'll. Uh, you know, knowing Real Madrid, it'll probably be Real Madrid to win by one goal, won't it? That's how they kind of operate some of these games. But this is no walk in the park. The you know the Athletic Club are banging the race for the top four, um, and you know this is an important game for them. They need to stay clear of. Uh, Atletico Madrid, they're only one point ahead of them. So, um, I mean, I look good into my head. I, I'm going to say, oh, gosh, I said oh, Real Madrid probably 1-0 is probably how it goes, you know. But I I, yeah. I do like the plus one. I do like the under. And don't underestimate the, the Basque visitors, basically what I'm uh, saying. J- just quickly, James, any thoughts on this one? I mean, Vinicius Junius is, is suspended. Uh, you're right. I mean... Bellingham with that last minute equal. Tony Kroos back in the Germany squad. There's a lot of emotion flying around at Real Madrid. Could they do without it for this game? And they're clear at the top of La Liga. Yeah, to me, it's a little bit similar to PSG and their game this weekend. And they've Definitely. got this big lead at the top of the table. They've got more important, they would think, games coming up. How do they How do they approach it? I'm kind of with Steve on this. If I was picking a bet, I'd probably go Athletic Club on the Asian handicap, minus 114 there with a plus one start. But you can see yourself just getting your stakes back because Real Madrid do just enough and get the win. So honestly, it would be a no bet for me. Um, But if I was to side with either side, it would be just Athletic Club for me. 2.45, Monday, Serie A, uh, Eastern time, Inter against Empoli, Inter a short price favourites and how. Uh, minus 5.30. Daniel, what do Inter do between now and the end of the season? What, what oh. can betters e- expect? Is, is there an angle? Win the league. Win the league. Well, <laughs> but, but, you think, know, the, I think it's enough. <laughs> <laughs> they're 14 points clear out of the Champions League, out of the Copper. From a betting point of view, week to week, what, what do we do with Inter? Do we back them? Do we fade them? I mean, em- Empley are interesting, even though the wheels have come off a little bit recently. Is there any angle in for this one for, for betters on Monday? I would say back Inter from now until the derby, which is on 22nd of April, when they can actually seal the Scudetto, but back them in a high-scoring game and perhaps a couple of both-to-score games because, yes, of the, perhaps the mental focus, the mental concentration might not be there. But look, for this game against Tempoli, Inter... Uh, are benefiting for the extra two days rest. And, you know, after an international break, playing on a Monday rather than on a Saturday with so many players returning from international break and obviously Inter got many more than Empoli, I think is a benefit for them. They won eight games to nil this season. They beat Lecce, Salernitana, Udinese and Frosinone at home without conceding. Empoli, they, ca- they played at Milano at San Siro a couple of weeks ago. They were a little bit timid. They were defeated 1-0 by Milan. They don't think really have a goal. You might want to back Inter here, perhaps in an over 3.5 goals. And, you know, something completely crazy. It could be Inter win and both teams to score. Sommer, by the way, is injured. There's going to be Audero playing in goal. Interesting. That's the game featuring Inter on uh, Monday. Going to be interesting to see how they go about their business from here on in. Surely the Scudetto will be secured sooner rather than later, maybe uh, against Milan in the derby, as uh, Daniele has pointed out. One more section. Uh, we've got three picks from the boys before we wrap up here, so we'll try and rattle through these for you. They're all overs. We've got overs mad. We've got um, over two and a quarter, over two and a half times two. Um, we are in Spain, Italy, and in France. First of all, Saturday, 11.15 a.m. Steve, watch your overs play. Well, it's Almeria against Osasuna, over 2.25 goals. I think it's minus 127. Um, happiest team going into the international break? Almeria have got to be right up there on the list, haven't they? Won for the first time this season. Big round of applause to them. Um, I, I actually saw it coming. They... Um, they had a, that draw against Sevilla. They played quite well. So I wonder now, we might get London bus syndrome. They might as well have a go, you know, try and avoid finish bottom of the table. Osasuna in no man's land. There might be, I mean, there's quite a few teams in Spain, in La Liga, who I think might be on the beach early here, quite literally, this season. And there may be one of them. Um, I just don't see it being like a nil-nil. I think Almeria will, will bring the, the fireworks again and um, feels like quite an open game towards the end of the season where both teams score and, and the goal line just seems low to me 2.25 goal line you could go two and a half if you're feeling more brave but uh, i think this will be quite a good watch actually dan so very happy to strike uh, with the goals in this game almeria osasuna over two and a quarter saturday 345 eastern win italy danielli for your overs play 
My other place is in Firenze, Fiorentina Milan over 2.5 goals. Uh, Milan in the last 11 games have kept the same pace with Inter, 26 points, Inter 30. So basically, Milan good numbers this season have been overshadowed by the fact that their city rivals have been so good. If you look at the overall number, Milan only, only one point less in the table compared to two years ago when they won the league. But away from home, they've been extremely leaky. Only four clean sheets, 25 goals conceded. However, Milan are the only side in Serie A alongside Inter to always score away from home. 73% of Milan away games have ended with both to score. Fiorentina unbeaten in six, but haven't kept a clean sheet at home against any of the five teams they played. Scored two against Bologna, Lazio and uh, Roma. Uh, interesting enough, 11, in 11 Milan away games, there have been goals after the 75th minutes. I go for over 2.5 goals. By the way, this is going to be an emotional game. First game in Florence after the sad passing of Joe Barone, the sporting director, and that's why Fiorentina game against Atalanta was postponed. Over 2.5 goals, minus 120. And finally, in uh, Liga 9 a.m. Sunday, James. Yeah, Claremont versus Toulouse is my pick over 2.5 goals at minus 109. Claremont are six points from absolute safety down their bottom of the table. They are running out of time to save themselves. So they have to go for it here. And Toulouse are not clear of relegation either. This also, the overs pick here, Dan, ties into what I was saying earlier. We can expect the number of games with over 2.5 goals to tick up from here on in in League One because that's what normally happens. So I'm expecting an open game here and I'm also expecting mistakes. I don't really trust either of those two defences. I think we'll see some mistakes here. Uh, so over 2.5 goals is the pick at minus 109. If you are following our overs, that's Almeria Osasuna over two and a quarter, Fiorentina Milan over two and a half and Clement against Toulouse over two and a half. The parlay is just over five to one. Steve, Danielli, James, thanks for your company. Good luck to all. We'll keep everyone updated over the course of the weekend into Monday via our Twitter feeds. That's a wrap for Betting Weekly Extra Time European show. We will be back next week for Picks, Plays, Hot Dogs and then over five and a half from Steve, maybe. <laughs> Follow us at Because We Win and subscribe to our YouTube channel. From all of us for now, it's goodbye. 